hope you all had a good holiday weekend if you're here in the U.S. Um, I apologize that this segment's a little bit late in the week compared to when I've been trying to get it up normally. Unfortunately, due to not having used the correct microphone when I recorded this the first time around, it was the microphone's pretty... It was the camera's pretty terrible internal microphone, and we'll put a segment of that in just so you can hear how bad that is. Welcome back, everybody. I didn't have access to the green screen, and I didn't have something that I was actually happy putting up. Uh, getting right into what would have been last week's news, uh, the GFI 27 DBXA monitor review is now live. You can see both segments of that, our unboxing and initial impressions, as well as the review. And spoiler alert, guys, I really liked it. The panel looked beautiful, 180 hertz is a wonderful thing to see. As far as I could tell, G-Sync worked as intended. The color calibration was second to none. I mean, I, I have professional level ultra sharps that don't hit the color space reproduction that that panel did. Although, to their credit, most of those ultra sharps came pre-calibrated from the factory, whereas you are going to want to invest in something like a, a Spider Elite, or some other similar color calibrator if you buy three or four of these things for uh, anything color sensitive. Although that goes for most monitors, even the ultra sharps, factory or not, I still want them all calibrated the same. Next up is pocketcraft.servegame.com is live. That is our demo of the Byte 4 being a little server running Minecraft. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, as far as server applications go, there's plenty that I could put on there, but not many that would actually be an interactive demo for you guys. So, like, I could have stood up a PBX on it, I could have stood up OpenSense on it, um, I could have stood up Zabbix, and I probably could have run all three of those and a couple of others on the same system without too much fuss, thanks to being a relatively recent Atom processor and having plenty of room for additional storage, and ours... Well, I crammed 16 gigs of RAM in it, which is beyond manufacturer's spec, but you're welcome to see how we did it. And honestly, it wasn't that difficult to do, just required a little bit of reading to get the right modules. Uh, but anyway, back to Minecraft, that's there because that's interactive. So I can show you it routing a gigabit link, or I can show you it handling several dozen phone calls at once. Those are great, but you can't see those and you can't feel them in real time. So this. You can use that URL, you can connect to it and play on it. We've got uh, MCMMO and Dynamap up and running. We also have Geyser and Water... Geyser and Waterfall? Floodgate and Waterfall uh, up and running so that you can connect using Bedrock clients, which means Android phones, iOS, PS4, PS5, uh, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, and I think the Nintendo Switch should all be able to connect to it. I connected to it with my phone just to make sure that it worked a little while ago. Uh, have fun. Don't be a dick. We do have an anti-grief plugin running on it as well so that uh, people can't make too much a mess of it. And we do have some backups running in case all hell breaks loose. Google is testing wake word free actions. And I'm kind of back and forth on this. I understand the convenience aspect of it. I do like some of the security measures that are required to actually use that, and those are twofold. Number one is that it can be enabled on a per device basis. So you could take a home mini or a Lenovo smart clock in a bedroom and enable the feature, whereas the one in your kitchen or your living room will not respond with the example actions, which are turn the lights on. Um, the other is that it is keyed to an individual user's voice. So the home mini in this case in my bedroom will respond to my voice, whereas the one in my child's room will not respond to them coming in and say, turn the lights on. Granted, they could still just say, okay, Google, turn the lights on, but that's besides the point here. Um, personally, I actually just want to be able to change the wake word I don't necessarily want to use actions without it. And maybe that's just me thinking back to, you know, watching Star Trek The Next Generation and listening to them be able, computer, lights, 
and seeing it happen, which I've wanted since the early 90s. <laughs> That's all there is on that. Uh, Paul's got a little write-up on his thoughts of it, as well as a link to his original source. There'll be a link to that in the description below. Windows 11. Love it or hate it is coming and uh, will be available on October 5th. So we have a date now and some people are complaining that that's Armageddon. Some people are looking forward to it. I'm personally looking forward to it because I have a lot of stuff here at work that uh, quite frankly doesn't even officially support Windows 10 and we're still using it. So Windows 11 may finally get some of that particular equipment replaced. Now. The caveat here is that what a lot of people are not necessarily keeping in mind when they say, oh my God, Windows 11 is coming and it's going to be here you know, next month, your computer's not going to suddenly stop working. I mean, I've got a whole fleet of third gen i5 laptops that are still going to be just as functional running Windows 10 Pro on October 6th as they were on October 4th. They're not going to suddenly blow up. But that does put a firm sunset date of, I believe, somewhere in 2025, where I either need to do an unsupported upgrade before then, for them to continue being on a functional build of Windows, or replace them. And at least with those, I hope the option is replace them. Some of our other equipment, you know, I've got some 6th Gen i7s and things like that that I might try the unsupported and that may work fine because although I may not get the latest chipset drivers or security bell and whistle, you know what, it's got a video card in it and I'm having it run a display wall. Great. It, it'll keep doing that whether or not I have the latest TPM in it. Um, what I think Microsoft has really made a mess of here is honestly their messaging on Windows 11. They have been kind of hit and miss on the hardware requirements. They released that hardware test app to tell you if your system worked, but it didn't actually give you a useful report. And some of these things they've been kind of evasive on. Like, you can run Windows 11 on unsupported hardware. You will have to do a clean install. It will not update automatically through Windows Update. But they've made such a mess of the messaging that I think they're getting a lot of bad press. And honestly, they deserve to take their lumps just for not handling customers' expectations correctly. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. We could do a whole section on how corporations and Microsoft in particular manage to mess up what they're telling the public about their new products. And I'm sure that I'm guilty of that on occasion as well. I originally promised that monitor review we talked about in about a month and it actually took me a month and a half to two months because of people went on vacation, it took me more time to build things, I needed to get my hands on hardware I didn't originally have, and then scheduling just kicked in. So that's unfortunate but just a reality there for me as well. Moving on, uh, Western Digital is announcing their new OptiMand technology. This one at first glance looked like something we've already seen and played with before, which is SSHDs, and newsflash, I never liked them. The idea was that you could use a small amount of NAND to accelerate what the hard drive was doing and speed things up, and most of the implementations just outright sucked, and the few that had promise were overpriced. Well, a modern hard drive, just like in a good SSD actually, uses a small chunk of DRAM to buffer incoming and outgoing writes, and it basically does the same thing. If I have writes that are scattered all around the platter, they get thrown into this DRAM where the controller will then order them in the best way that it can write them to this rotational disk, and then write them out as sequentially as feasible. Well, OptiNand is a step, is a concept, is a, well, I guess it's a shipping product at this point, actually, although I don't have one in hand and 
it's only gone to undisclosed customers, which probably just means enterprise validation, is what Western Digital is looking at to solve the growing size of that DRAM cache with their new 20 terabyte hard drives that are using energy assisted recording. And the idea is that we're not going to do what SSHDs did, which was claim that we were going to get SSD like performance across the entire drive, but we're going to replace that DRAM cache with a much larger NAND cache. And the main benefits here are number one, NAND's cheaper. You know, if I had to have 64 megs of RAM versus, we'll say, 256 megs of TLC, well, it's going to cost me less to have 256 megs of TLC. Uh, and the actual price for that, I don't know. So we're not going to get into the actual bill of materials, dollars and cents there. However, there's a downside, well, the, there's advantages here. And the advantages from Western Digital's standpoint is that the drive will have more ability to handle power loss events and dump more data to the disk than it would with DRAM. And I can't argue against that. DRAM, when you lose power, goes empty. NAND, when you lose power, will stay exactly the way it is for, I believe, about 10 years for a typical consumer SSD. Um, maybe I should find a way to test that, although we'd have to come back 10 years later and find out. But anyway, so the idea here is that we use NAND, that gives us a cheaper option to put more of it there. We are doing basically the same thing with it, although we can do it more efficiently because we have more space. In addition to that, a power loss event, what's in the NAND stays there. So instead of being able to write, say, 10 or 20 megabytes to the disk when we lose power, we can dump a few hundred megabytes to the disk. That's all fairly reasonable and pretty logical. Now the performance impact on this, I don't know till we see it tested. And quite frankly, direct to NAND writes are generally not fantastic, so I don't really know what they would have done here to make them great. Typically direct to TLC, you can get a couple hundred megs, and that's on a full one terabyte SSD. Um, compared to just 128 meg chunk of it or 256 meg chunk of it, there, you don't have the parallelism that a modern SSD relies on to handle the direct writes there. Now, the flip side of this coin and the other, the other major concern that I have here is actually an endurance one. So DRAM, because it's non volatile and because of the way it's structured, you can theoretically write for decades, continually rewriting what it is. NAND has a limited number of program erase cycles in the several thousand number. I want to say modern TLC might hit a few thousand program erase. Well, if I've only got a 256 meg chunk, chunk of it, I'm concerned that I'm going to burn through it. And that's actually my big scary thought with OptiNAND is that this takes a technology that generally didn't have a finite lifespan. I mean, don't get me wrong, hard drives fail and they fail regularly. But most of their failures are not related to the magnetic media itself. As long as it's still spinning and as long as you don't crash the heads into it, the magnetic media should read and write unless it's physically damaged. And a lot of your hard drive failures do involve either A, you know, they've got little dust filters they can suck crap in and it gets on the disc and that's bad, or B, those heads float really close to the disc and all it takes is a good bump to throw that alignment off and then they crash into the drive. I've actually seen some where the read and write heads got welded straight to the drive, or finally just the motors give out or a bearing gives out and it throws it off access. But those take hundreds of not, yeah, hundreds of thousands of hours, years to happen. You can grab a drive that was in, a, in use from the 90s, typically, 
And as long as it wasn't abused, it'll still work. I mean, I've got working drives from decades ago. Whereas if those drives had just been powered on and constantly read and written to, and they were an SSD, I eventually will have burned through all the program erase cycles of the NAND. Now, for modern SSD, it's just a non-issue. I mean, my most used SSDs have 100 terabytes written to them after five years. And quite frankly, I write far more than most consumer workloads. This OptiNAND though, that part scares me, especially coming from Western Digital with their component swapping shenanigans lately. Guys, you're, you're in the press for some bad stuff right now. A new technology where you could conceive, conceivably do the same thing is just not a new, not a good look. All right, um, last out, and I don't have it up here on the board, that giveaway that I've been yelling about for Extra Life is finally available. So there'll be a link to that. I believe they're running a Gleam giveaway. I think this is an international giveaway for that Cooler Master PC. And go ahead and enter. Um, I don't know if it was anyone who watched any of these videos that did it, but somebody finally uh, kicked them over that $14,000 mark. They are still raising money. There's other stretch goals besides these giveaways. So if you are interested in helping out the Children's Hospital, please do go ahead. Um, outside of that, I just want to close out. Um, as always, I want to thank Electrix for providing our opening and closing themes. I want to thank anyone who helps support Pocketables either via Patreon or our Amazon affiliate links. It's support like that that helps make videos like this possible. And finally, thank you for watching.